We are in this series we started last week called The Empowering Presence of God. The Empowering Presence of God. And um, it really is birthed out of uh, something that when I was just in a prayer time and with God and <clears throat> He really laid on my heart, you know, that, that, and preachers say this all the time, preachers, prophets, apostles, whatever, evangelists, you know, from time to time, we, you know, we have a word, you know, God gives us a word that there's a change coming and I'm doing all things new and, you know, and, and forget about the past and we know all of those things. And, and so maybe you might say, well, this is just another one of those words, uh, but I promise you it is a word from God that he's, he's bringing us through this river and um, we're, you know, when we step up on the bank on the other side of it, uh, there's going to be some things that we haven't seen before. You know, um, I know there's nothing new under the sun, uh, but there are some things we haven't seen under the sun. It may not be new. Nothing's new to God, uh, but there are some things that'll be new to us, and he's really bringing us through that. And in order for us to really see what God has and what he's going to do in and through the church, we must press in to his presence. We've got to press into his presence. So we're talking out of Psalm 16 and just one verse out of Psalm 16. We're talking about the empowering presence of God. Today, I want to just talk to you a little bit about making a personal place for his presence, making a personal place for the presence of God. You know, his will is that we should push on into his presence and live our life there in his presence. You know, it's more than just doctrine to be held. It's, it's, it's a relationship. This is a life for us. I always like to say that what, and I really don't like to put it this way because I, because Christianity really is not a religion, even though the world calls it a religion. But what differentiates us from other religions is truly the relationship. Well, obviously, besides the fact that our Savior rose from the grave and is resurrected and nobody else has done that. Come on. He said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Okay, that's the Savior that I want to serve. I don't know about you. Uh, but beside that uh, is really, it's, it's about relationship. You know all, the, 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 you know all the, 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 the cliches, you know, it's done and, you know, we don't have to do in other religions, you have to do and all of that. And I know many of you know those things, but at the end of the day, that's what it truly is about. It's about relationship. It's about our relationship with him. And so I love what Moses said. I love what he said. You know, God said, you know, he told his people, this is what I want you to do. Moses, take the children of Israel. And he said, listen, Lord, we're going to go. But if your presence doesn't go with us, I will not go. We won't go. We won't go. And we have to come to the place in our lives, in our walk, in our Christian walk, where we're going to say, listen, there's a lot of things that we can do and there's a lot of wrongs to be righted and a lot of whatever it may be. But if God's presence doesn't go, then I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go if his presence doesn't go with me. And so we're talking about the presence of God. Listen to how David put this in Psalms 16, verse 11. He said, you will show me the path of life in your presence is the fullness of joy at your right hand. There are pleasures evermore. The God's word translation put it this way. says, you make the path of life known unto me. This word here, complete, complete joy is in your presence. Pleasures are by your side forever. I cannot emphasize that word there enough. Complete, complete. This is the God that we serve. All complete. He uses words like all and complete and I am, right? He finalizes it. This is it, right? I mean, you know, even in Revelation, he talks about a line and he says, listen, I don't want you to be lukewarm. I want you to be all in one way or the other. I want you to be cold, all cold, all hot, whatever it is, be all. All. That's the God we serve. And so that's where we have to come to. We have to come to that place where we're not teetering. Come on, we're not teetering. My wife and I were having a conversation this morning just about how the church and we're trying to be relevant. And we absolutely want to be relevant. You know, I, when I was growing up in church, I would have never dreamed of just wearing a shirt and pants to church. I, I mean, it was just I, whether it was cultural or what. 
you know, I feel so free now, you know, and, uh, and but every once in a but I like, you know, I like doing different things. Sometimes I wear my, you know, I wear my suit jacket or other days I'll just, uh, you know, wear a shirt and pants or whatever. And relevancy uh, may have everything to do with that, but it has nothing to do with the standard of God's word. That never changes. It's always relevant that you, we don't have to do anything to God's word to be relevant. And therein, for many of us, lies the rub. How do we do that? How, how are we relevant, but at the same time not compromising? That's the rub. And I think that the only way we find that out is to press into his presence. You want to know why? Because Jesus was absolutely able to do that. When he walked the earth, he went to what I call the Matthew party. He was at Matthew's house with sinners and tax collectors and all of that and disciples and the disciples and, and, and Pharisees were wondering, why are you sitting with all those sinners and tax collectors? And it doesn't say it in the scripture, but probably the tax collectors and sinners were like, why are you with all those snooty people, you know, over there? And so, but he's relevant. He's relevant to everybody, never compromised. How could he? He is the word of God. He's the walking, living, breathing word of God, never compromised. And we can do that. We can absolutely do that if we'll learn to press into his presence. And God has reasons for his presence. Let me think of this. Think of a couple of scenarios. One is, think of, think of one of your favorite musical artists. Whether it's, you don't have to say it out loud, whether it's a secular artist or whether it's a Christian artist or whatever it may be. I mean, way back when I was growing up, uh, you know, back in the, in the late 70s, you know, I used to, my mom used to listen to this group called the Mighty Clouds of Joy. We used to like the Mighty Clouds of Joy. Most of you never heard of the Mighty Clouds. Maybe you have, Brother James. He has. And, uh, but then I, you know, she'd listen to that and I'd listen to Earth, Wind, and Fire. You know, they were, they were one of my favorite groups, you know. And I know some of y'all like the Beatles. Don't lie. You know, you like the Beatles and, you know, all of those groups. So whatever your favorite uh, musical artist is, and imagine you're at home listening to uh, you know, the album, or I guess now be your, not even your iPod anymore, maybe just on your phone or whatever you're listening to. And all of a sudden there's a knock at the door and at the door, you know, it's, it's Paul McCartney or it's, you know, Amy Grant or who, Michael W. Smith is at the door, you know, and he comes in and do you imagine that you would say, you know what, uh, it's so great that you came by my house, have a seat over there. I'm listening to the record. I want to hear this record and then I'll get with you. You probably wouldn't do that. You probably turn off the record and go over to Michael W. Smith. I want to hear you sing live and in person because he's there. Imagine also that you're driving down the street. Now, many of you who drive, who have your license, uh, know that there are laws that we have. And you're driving down the street, and when you see that big, what is it, an octagon, big red octagon with S-T-O-P or A-L-T-O, you know, if you're Spanish, America, you either speak English or Spanish. And um, you, so when you, when you come up to that thing, you know you are supposed to stop, right? Stop. That's, that's the law. Or when you see the traffic light, and it's red, you're supposed to stop. But now imagine you are driving around Bloomington and you come up to that stop sign, but there is a traffic cop there and the traffic cop has his or her whistle and they're doing like this. What do you do? Somebody tell me what you do. Even though the stop sign is there, but there's a stop sign or the light is red, you know the law. The law on the book says when the red light stop. When there's a stop sign, stop. But you see the traffic cop there doing like this. So what do we do? We go. Why do we go? Because the living representation of the law is there now. Michael W. Smith is here now. Natalie Cole, I'll say Natalie Cole. Natalie Cole, she's here. I got to meet her one time, by the way. You know, she, she's here, so I would rather, so I know I have her records, but if she's here, I'd rather hear her sing. I, I know that the, the, the stop sign says to stop, but if the police officer is there, I'm going to follow his or her direction because they are there in person. And it's not that they're, we're breaking the, are you breaking the law? No, you're not breaking the law. It's really a fulfillment of the law. Come on, somebody. 
There's a fulfillment of the law there. There's a fulfillment there. And so that's why we can spend the rest of our lives reading uh, God's word. We can spend the rest of our lives quoting scripture, memorizing scripture. But until we press into the presence of God, our, our, our Bible is a vehicle that gets us into his presence. And so if all you ever have is his Bible, as, as wonderful as the word of God is, if all you ever have are words written on a page and you never have his presence, then you're missing the whole point of why he wants you to read his word. And so God wants us to come into his presence. There is a presence that he wants us to come into. That's why he says, uh, that's why David says, in your presence. Not in the scrolls is the fulfillment of joy. Not in the law is the fulfillment of joy, but in your presence. And there is a reason. There is a reason that God wants us to come into his presence. He says, because in my presence, I, I get to commune with my people. In my presence, I confirm my word to my people. In my presence, I inspire you to do great things, to do great and mighty things in my presence. When you're in the presence of God, sometimes just spend some time with God. Have a bad day. Next day, get up in the morning. Spend some time before you do anything, before you try to fix what happened yesterday. Get in the presence of God. Listen to some worship music. Pray. Read a couple scriptures. And I guarantee you, by the time you're done, you'll feel like you can do anything. Because God inspires us. He calls his people to action. And then in his presence is where you find comfort, healing, restoration. He inspires courage and faith and a new vision. That's his desire for us. That's why he wants to bring his presence to us. It's not, it, it's not as much, yes, he enjoys us and he wants to be with us. But it's not that he can get something from us. I love Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, in the message version of the Bible. The message version talks about how God has this lavish love, and he lavishes it upon us. Not to get anything from us, but to give everything of himself to us. And that's why he brings his presence to us. That's the reason. But guess what? There's also benefits. You know I have 37 points, but I'm going to get it all in. Uh, but but, he, but there, there's also reasons, there's benefits for us being in his presence. First of all, we can talk to God directly. That's the point. We can talk to God directly. You know, I don't want to be a, a pastor who has you depend on me for everything. We, we, we will always need shepherds. Uh, Matt, we will always need shepherds. God has made that uh, very clear. We'll always, uh, I believe in apostles and, I, and, and we will always need the prophetic word and we'll always need evangelists. Lord knows we need evangelists right now. And we, we always need teachers, okay? We always need counselors, always, right? And Jody, I know as much as you love counseling and you want people to come to you for counseling, after a certain amount of time, you want people to get what you're saying so that they can get better. And it's not that I, I don't want to have a job, but at the same time, my job is to make you better, okay? And so uh, what my, my point is that as a pastor, I want you to seek God for yourself. I don't want you to take what I say, uh, you know, at face value without looking at it in scripture. I want you to be like the Bereans. That's what I want you to do, okay? And we can talk to our Father directly. The veil is torn. The curtain is torn. We can go boldly to the throne and talk to him. That's a benefit for us. Our needs are met in his presence. Why do we go anywhere else? Because at your right hand, there are pleasures evermore. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. Why do we go to other places to look for satisfaction when it's all in his presence? Our thirsty hearts can no longer have to search, okay? And God, listen, he's not some future goal. He's not some mental ascent, all right? He is a right this second presence. His presence is right here, right now. And God is a God who says, listen, just come simply. You don't have to know all of the, the, the Christian vernacular. You don't have to speak King James to come into my presence, right? You don't have to, you know, you don't have to know what all the Christians say to get into my presence. Just come and talk to me. That's all he's saying. Simplicity, right? He's personal and real and nothing can prevent us from getting into his presence, and the, what, the wonderful thing I like about God, not that I would ever think about doing this, but if we ever quit him, he never quits us. 
Come on. He never gives up on us. God never stops. He never goes out off duty. He never goes out to lunch. He's never out of business. Come on. God is always there. He never sleeps nor slumbers. And the only one we have, uh, the only, he's the only one that we have that has the words of life. I love it when Peter said that. Jesus said, oh, everybody's leaving me. Are you going to leave me too? Where am I going to go? I don't understand everything you're doing. <laughs> I don't understand what you're saying, Jesus. But you know what? Where am I going to go? You have the words of life. That's what we have to settle in our heart. He has the words of life. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet, not I, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now have, I live in this flesh by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We're all, we have to be all in. We have to be all in. We look at it like, Man, I'm giving up something. I, I, you know, I'm giving up part of my life, and I just don't know if I can do all of that. And, you know, you're asking a lot of me. I mean, I've, I've built up this life. Listen, we have to understand we'd be nothing. We'd be nothing without him, right? We'd be absolutely nothing. He already knows what makes us happy. He already knows what brings us joy. And not just because he's like your dad or your mom who knows you so well or your sister it, or your best friend. No, he, he, he put those things in you. When he breathed the breath of life in you, he formed you, made you. He gave you your personality. He gave you the way that you think. All right. He, 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 he said it so that a certain age you might not have hair. Come on, Kevin. You know, he, he, know, he, know, he knows everything. Right. He sees the end from the beginning. He knows all of those things. That's why it's right to go to him for our joy to be filled. He already knows. He already knows. And for us to get there, we know that we have to be born again by the Spirit. But we must press in. We must not give up. We can't give up on each other and we can't give up on God. As much as we want to sometimes. I mean, if we were just honest, we would admit that there are times in our life where we just get tired. You know, I get tired. I'm tired of being offended. I'm tired of trying and nothing's changing. I'm tired of taking one step forward and two steps back. I'm tired. I'm tired. You serve a God, though, that, had, that never sleeps, never slumbers. He, he, he restarted the world. Come on. I mean, uh, he, you're talking about somebody who's patient. You're talking about somebody who's patient. He is patient with us. We serve a God who is patient with us. And so we can never give up. We can never give up. His presence for us is, first of all, a place of covenant blessing. It's something that he promised us. And there's a promise that he's given us that he never goes back on. It's a place of covenant blessing, the blessing of Abraham. Yes, I know it's a cliche-ish to a lot of Christians, but the blessing he placed there was for all time. It's an eternal blessing for us. And again, I, I want us to get to the place where we're not seeking some one-off blessing. Lord, I really need the money this month. Can you come through? Well, he's able to do that. He's able to do that. There's no problem with that. But I'm tired of us walking from miracle to miracle, blessing to blessing. He's given us a, a covenant blessing that we can walk in, walk in the anointing, walk in the blessing. You know, if we, if we look, I, I can't say for everybody else, I'll look at my own life. Most of my life, if I were to give a percentage to it, which I know you can't really do, I would say that I probably walked in about 8% of the anointing that God's put on my life. He put it there. It's not that the anointing is not there, but it's up to me to walk it out. And, and if, if, it, if I were doing the calculations, looking back over my life, I probably walked in about, maybe not even that much, about 4% of, of all that God has had there for me to walk in. All of the blessing, how I could bless others, right? How I could be happy, how I could have joy, but I choose not to or had chosen not to, all right? But his covenant blessing is there for us. And we, we, we need to practice the presence of God. It's a place of intercession. It's a place where we go to get into God's presence to intercede for others. It's not just for us. It's for others as well. And it's a place of brokenness. I don't care how broken you are. I don't care what you've been through. I don't care how much you've been offended. I don't care how much you've been beat down, how much you've been abused, how much you've abused yourself. Come on. I don't care what you've been through. There is a place in the presence of God where brokenness is restored, 
we're cracks in our armor, God is able to put us on that wheel and just lovingly begin to shape us and put us back together if we'll allow him to do it. But too often, we either try to fix it ourselves or we just give up and don't even go to that place because we've tried to fix it ourselves. A place of brokenness for God. You know, he told Jacob, he said, your name will no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. God loves the overcomer. I, you know, if you're at a place where you're tired of struggling, think about this. God loves the overcomer. Just like when the caterpillar struggles to get out of that cocoon and he turns into, she turns into a butterfly. Come on, the struggle, the struggle. Yeah, I know. I, I don't want to have to struggle. But that's the way it is. You don't overcome. You don't overcome unless there's an obstacle in your way. You can't say I'm an overcomer unless there's an obstacle. And by the way, if you read the book of Revelation, uh, Jesus says that in the throne room will be the overcomer. The overcomer. Not the one that was given everything. Not the one that never struggled. Not the one that gave up. The overcomer. What do you choose to be? What do you choose to be? It's a place of communion. A place of mercy where we find mercy. And God's mercy is not like anyone else's mercy. Yeah, I did. This, this, this struck my heart some years ago when Joyce Meyer said it. She said that I am so glad that, you know, that God's mercy is new every morning. You know, David said, your mercies are new every morning. She said, I'm so glad because I used up all the mercy he gave me yesterday. <laughs> I'm so glad you got a new one <laughs> for me today. As soon as you wake up, mercy's waiting on you. and His mercy endures forever. But it's in his presence you can run from his mercy. He can give you mercy and you can run from it. It's in his presence that you get mercy. It's a place of joy and rejoicing. Joy and rejoicing is in his presence. You will show me the path of life. Come on, our base scripture. In your presence is the fullness of joy. It's a place where impossible situations are met. God loves to do the impossible. Come on. And if you don't believe that, just read back through the Old Testament. I mean, he stopped time. Come on. He, he's, he's, he, he, uh, he, 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 he separated the Red Sea and then he separated the Jordan. And I believe that he sat back and said, you know, I'm just getting started. That ain't nothing. I'm just getting started. Wait till you see what I'm going to do. And then one of the greatest things he's ever done it's throughout the whole universe, out of all of the billions of stars and how many ever planets. And I know the Navy said they just saw some UFOs, so whatever, uh, UFOs or life and whatever else is out there. Out of all of that and out of all the 8 billion people on planet Earth, he, and I'm going to use old school language, old school Christian language, he saw fit to save me. That's the greatest thing to me that he's ever done, that he's ever done. Come on, out of all the great things he's done. It's a place where uh, we can get transformed. Now see, in the world we can get conformed. We know Romans 12. We know it very well. You got, I'm talking to people who know, most of you know the Bible. Come on. But it's a place where we can get transformed and stop being conformed by the world. In other words, we walk into situations and we, we might call it code switching or we might call it walking into a situation and just doing uh, as they do in Rome, right? Do as the Romans do or whatever you might call it. And all of that is conforming. But God, coming into the presence of God, he has a way of transforming us, metamorphosizing us from the inside out right? Just like that butterfly. He has a way of reaching in us and bringing out the real us, the spirit man, so that the whole world will see the true us, not just what's on the outside and not just what we see when we look in the mirror. He transforms us, transforms us into what he wants us to be. And then that place is a place of refreshing. I love it because it's a place where we, and how many know we need refreshing? We need refreshing from time to time. Jesus needed refreshing. That's why he went away and he prayed by himself. He needed to be refreshed. And so if he needed to be refreshed when he was in the flesh, we need to be refreshed. And in his presence is a place of refreshing. God will refresh you in his presence. It's not just about you and what can I do? What do I need to pray for? And how do I talk to God? And, uh, you know, it's, it's not just some effort. 
But you can go and God is telling you, I'm telling you, he's saying to you that you don't have to have all of the words. You don't have to have all of your ducks in a row. You don't have to have everything together. You know, you may be a lot like me. I'm a person who's like that. I, I, I'm, I'm thinking, man, I got to get things together. I got to get my finances together. I got to get, you know, my life together. And I, I, gotta, I got too much stuff on my desk and I need to really clear that off. And I got too many emails and I got to catch up on, you know, all the Instagram stories or whatever it may be or, you know, all this stuff that I need to do. And I, I need to call my brother and I got, let me get all this stuff together and then I'll go and have my quiet time with God. But you know what God is? God is, and the last one is a place of worship. God is a God where God, God's, God doesn't love and welcome drama, but God doesn't run from drama. God doesn't run from drama. And if, and if you don't believe that, you know, you might think, well, I mean, I can't go to God right now. I mean, it's a mess. You know, you should have seen the conversation with me and my sister. And we were talking about who's going to take care of mom. And we started arguing and, you know, she was cursing. And I almost said a curse word. And, you know, all this stuff happened. And it's just, my family's just a mess. And then my brother called and he got into it. And then my cousin and it was just a mess. We don't know what's going to happen. And so let me just, you know, let me get myself together. Then I'll go pray. But you know what God is saying? He says, right here, right now, right in the middle of all of that, just come into my presence right now. Right now, in the middle of all of that. And if you don't believe it, think about the story. I think it's over in Mark 4, 38, where Jesus was on the boat. Very familiar uh, passage of scripture. And he, he said, let's go to the other side, right? He was on the boat and he was uh, asleep on the boat, right? You know it now. And the storm came up. The, the waves were beating against the boat. The wind was rushing against the sails. The rain was coming down. And they said, do you not care that we're about to die? We are perishing. You know what Jesus said? He, he, you know, at first, before I went back and looked at the scripture, I was thinking it was one of those situations where he said, oh, ye of little faith. But if, that's not what he said this time. He said, how is it that you have no faith? How is it? What are you talking about? Do you see what's going on out here? Did you hear what my sister said? Come on now. No. If she wasn't my sister... Come on, people don't talk to me like that. All right, people don't talk to me like that. If she was my sister now, did you hear what she said? Yeah, I heard it. And he comes out and he says, peace, be still. He's not afraid of the storm. He's not afraid of drama. He's not afraid of what you're going through. Everything you're going through, he already knew it. Before he created you, he knew you was going to go through what you're going through right now. He knew all the bad thoughts you were going to have. He knew all the fails you would have. He knew all the people that would offend you. He knew all the people you would offend. It surprises you sometimes when things happen. But guess what? He already knew it, and his love is already with you. His mercy is waiting on you tomorrow. What's today? The 20th? Or what's today? The 30th? 30th? His, his Memorial Day, when you wake up, he's got a mercy already waiting on you. It's already waiting on you. Now listen, I'm not telling you go out and do something bad. Don't curse nobody out just because you know of, of mercy's waiting on you because God really going to get you in. He's a daddy. But, but isn't it comforting to know his grace and his mercy is already in, his, his grace and his mercy is already uh, at Memorial Day 2021. He, he's already there. He's waiting on you to wake up and say, my grace is here. My mercy's here. It's already here. And he already knows what's going on in your life. So God's not afraid of your drama. He's not afraid of any of those things. So we have to be a people who are not afraid to go into his presence. Now we can understand why he said you can come boldly to the throne. You come boldly to the throne. Just come on in. Come on in. Why are you even knocking on the door? Just come on in. Just come on in. And I believe God is saying that to us even today. We have to find a personal place for his presence. He's saying, come on in. And I know there's a lot of stuff on your mind. I, I know all the things that we've been through these last couple years or whatever it's been, stuff still going on and family drama and job situation and getting out of school and what am I going to do next? And there's all kind of stuff. You know what I want to tell you right now before we pray is that there's always going to be stuff. 
It's always going to be stuff. If, if it's not this, it's going to be something else. There's always something going on in the world. I mean, the economy's going to be up and it's going to be down. It's going to be this person in office, then it's going to be that person. It's just always going to happen. I mean, the, all, the, your sister's going to be happy with you one day and mad at you the next day. It, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to give a negative confession. I'm just telling you that life is going to be up and down. Life is going to be up and down. But that doesn't mean you have to be. That doesn't mean you have to be. You have to be the calm in the storm. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is to go to the calm in the storm. Jesus and the presence of God is the eye of the hurricane. He's the eye of the hurricane. And in there you can get clarity. In there you can get revelation. In there you can take a breath. And there you can see more clearly. See, because when he comes in, I love this song we used to sing called When You Walk Into the Room. Because when he walks into the room, light shines on the situation. Oh, now I see. Now I see. One other scripture um, that I thought about is when, uh, you know, Jesus, I believe Jesus says that, uh, you know, something to the effect that when we finally see Satan, we'll say, is this the one? Because light will be shown on him. Is this the one that brought down nations? You know what I want to say to you? Some of your problems are like that right now. I believe if you come into the presence of the Lord, you'll say, is this the problem that's been tripping me up this whole time? Is this what I've been tripping off of? <laughs> is, is this what I've been so upset about? Is this what I've been so stressed about? Once God is able to shine the light on that thing. 